Hello folks, Dale Piper here. Smoking today. Sherlock Holmes original. From 1990. And uh, how you might say, do you know it's from 1990? Well, I read the, the hallmarks on the silver. If ever you get these uh, hallmark pipes made in England, or made in the United Kingdom, um, there are some tiny little symbols uh, usually stamped on the bands which tell you uh, or can tell you where it's made, the fact that um, it's been properly assayed, in other words it's been to one of the many, well several now assay offices dotted around the country, uh, Birmingham, Sheffield, Chester, Dublin, London, they all have assay offices. And the idea is if a silversmith is making anything, he can get it stamped to demonstrate its worth as being 9 0.925, in other words, 925 parts per thousand silver and uh, guarantee its quality. So, um, if you look at the hallmarks, I'll put the pipe down. I can't do too many things at once. If you look at the hallmarks, um, there they are on this pipe. You've got the Sherlock Holmes symbol for the uh, Sherlock Holmes collection. And of course the P for Peterson. But then you've got um, what's called the Hibernia mark, which shows the duty has been paid and it's outside England. It This was um, assayed in the Dublin assay office and I know that because in the middle shield if you could only see it more sharply there is a harp which has a crown above it which indicates it's the silver silver assay office for Dublin so it's of the right quality it was made in Dublin and it was assayed letter E. And the assays, according to the dates they were assayed, go um, A to Z and then back to A to A again. So they keep running the letters of the alphabet according to a year. So letter E, and it's in that shape because they alter the E to be a curly E or a printed E or a small baby E and so on according to make a distinction because it's occurring every 26 years and this is a slightly slanting uh, capital E uh, and of that shape and if you look it up um, in the um, in the assay office records you'll find that that was the stamp they used in 1990 so I cracked the code talking of cracking codes There's another code that's been bothering people for a few weeks, and that's been the Sherlock Holmes Gore. I should have said at the outset, I should have put out a warning that this video will contain gores, yabos, and um, giveaways, oh sorry, Yabo, uh, Gore and um, Draws. <laughs> so you're going to get the works today in this video, so uh, those of a more delicate disposition should turn off straight away. So here we go, the long-awaited day. What's in the box? There we are. I've been very disciplined because I really want to get at what's in the box, but I sealed it up at the start of the gore. 
so I haven't been able to access it either. Still, let's not do a spoiler on it. Uh, let us consider the clues. Well, some of you may have noticed that yet more owls have joined me today. Uh, not only is there the Stuart Bass owl down here, but there's also a little owl family, uh, mother, father and a baby owl over there. They, I said the other day, would be the neutral observers for all of this. And behind me, on the other side, there's a little owl clock that isn't working at the moment, but when I get it fixed, its, owl, its eyes go from side to side, blink. And I've mentioned blinking till I'm blinking sick. <laughs> Anyhow, so first of all, there was the lamps. Owls. A lot of people couldn't comprehend the connection really but I gave you some other clues as well. On the shelf there, there was a box. The box is a popular suite in the mainland of Europe and uh, in Britain, and it's Turkish Delight. This one's made by a British company called Thornton's. And there you see the um, Turkish Delights in the centre there. But the real message was Turkish. So some of you picked up on that. Now, the box measurements. I did give you the measurements. And I indicated that the box, what was in it was half the height of the box, half the size, which would perhaps suggest another box within a box? Perhaps. Some clues are not conclusive. Now, one rather naughty one was I said about um, it being from somewhere not far away. That was a bit naughty because it's from Turkey. Now, and some of you may howl, well, Turkey's nowhere near England. But, do you know, it's not that far away. The distance to, from London to Istanbul is only about, uh, I think it's about 1,700 miles, 16-something hundred miles. And as the crow flies, it's a little bit closer. And if you consider, we're, I think, 5,200 miles from San Francisco, say, at the far side of the States. That means that Turkey is, in effect, not really that far away from us. But maybe that was a little bit naughty. Um, but you always get these sort of red herrings, don't you, when uh, you're solving clues. Uh, I did say that what was in the box was a fascination of mine. Now, I mentioned um, the fact that I was fascinated by these um, in an early video, which you would have had to troll through them all to, to probably find the reference. But I did say um, at the end of one of my videos, I think, that I was thinking of doing a piece on owls because I... Um, I once reared an owl um, when I was a boy. I was walking through the woods one day and I found a little owl fledgling. It was a little owl too. And um, I, uh, there was no, no mother around or anything. It was on the, uh, the bottom and it, it was not far from croaking. And so um, against perhaps my better judgment, I brought it home. Uh, I was always bringing stray animals and uh, birds and things home, but that was the way I was. I've always been an animal lover. And um, so um, my parents um, kindly allowed me to keep this owl and to rear it. In fact, my mother used to buy it, um, little um, 
quantities of minced meat from the local butchers and um we fed it first of all on um on sort of um milk and stuff and bread and what have you to start off with not a very appropriate diet for an owl but then we moved on to to meat and things which it um which it liked and thrived on and my father built um me a sort of cage for it with old tennis nets um which we um we had a, a veranda at the back of the house and he boxed all that in and then put the tennis nets up and all the rest of it and built perches inside for the bird and um, I used to have a glove that I used to get it out and and I reared it and eventually it was released to the wild um, I will tell the full story but I called the owl my name for him was blinkers <laughs> so I've made loads of blinking references to blinking in this but anyhow you want to know that I call him blinkers but what do owls do all the time but blink now the other big clue to, that was supposed to link you to owls was um, via North Carolina electrical manufacturer and that caused a few people to scratch their heads because unless you know you would not imagine that this uh, German electrical goods were made in North Carolina, but they, they are. I think it's the main dishwasher division, but I could be wrong. And that's Bosch Electricals, which of course are a German company. But many of their, um, well, they're certainly now made in North Carolina, big production. And quite a few American people who entered the goal got that. So um, it was solvable, that one. But Bosch, of course, you were left with the name Bosch and then the link with owls and the Renaissance painter. Well, many of you again cracked that one. And it was, of course, no lesser uh, painter than Hieronymus Bosch, who created some amazing, if not rather disturbed sometimes, works of art um, during the Renaissance period. And one thing he always... Um, very often at least he included was an owl um it it was to do i'm I, i'm going to do something on owls but i think the owls were have been regarded from certainly ancient times as possessing amazing qualities in that they are observers and um, they have an amazing ability they sleep when we're awake and they're awake when we're asleep and they can see in the dark when we can't see. So all in all, an owl is, was ascribed by a lot more primitive and superstitious people with amazing powers. And often the Renaissance artists portrayed them at what they painted as the gates of hell or the entrance to hell or in an observer position watching the human race from a distance put on a perch slightly always detached from the scene a bit like my friends around here in the owlery so Hieronymus Bosch and the link with owls oh there was a bit of a red herring which some of you picked up on I was wearing a pullover that I'd pinned a pin to and that pin if I show you a very tenuous loop, uh, link with the Sherlock Holmes theme and all the rest of it it's actually I don't know whether you can make that out but it's the um, Pipe Club of London and that's their the cross pipes is um, their badge and uh, they meet in J.J. Fox's. Um, Andrew Serigliano, Bluefin Piper, has just uh, had a trip to London. And one of the photographs he put up in his little um, travelogue relating to London was of J.J. Um, Fox's. And he, he, I believe he went in there. And a uh, great tobacconist, one of the oldest in, um, in London. It's where the Pipe Club of London meet once a month. And... Uh, London Calling, Simon has taken you along to a couple of those meetings, showed you the interior. 
They even have the chair that Winston Churchill used to sit in, his leather armchair, when he used to go there. And there's a separate ledger for Winston Churchill's tobacco purchases because he bought his cigars through J.J. Fox's. Anyhow, it was a, it's a London institution. And of course, I was sort of taking a dig at Sherlock Holmes, 221B, Baker Street. Actually, Baker Street's not really near um, St. James's Street, where J.J. Fox is. But if any of you visit London, um, do make the effort to go to J.J. Fox's. I just hope it's around uh, for a lot of years to come. Um, right, so what else have I not mentioned? Uh, or should have mentioned. Um, I kept saying, don't be blinkered. Blink or you'll miss it. The clues are all around you. And sure they are, or they were. So, <laughs> that doesn't solve the problem of what is in this box, really. So we've got this owl-related. We've got that it's from Turkey. It's not a big leap, is it, to think what other wonderful smoking product comes out of Turkey. But, Meerschaum. And I couldn't have timed this better because it's Meerschaum Madness Month. March Meerschaum Madness. I actually, I didn't know this was going to fall like this, but it's quite clever, isn't it? So here we go. Without further ado, a yabo. Sorry if that's not in my taste. So here we go. I did seal it up and everything so I couldn't get my mitts on it. There we are. <laughs> the grand reveal. It's a big leather case or leatherette. What is in the case? It should creak it should be a creaking hidden, shouldn't it? Look at that little beauty. It's Blinkers, he's come back. Isn't he splendid? He's on his branch. Beautifully carved. Nine millimeter filter. I don't know screw it now, I'll probably break it. There we are, takes a nine millimeter filter. <sighs> Wonderful bow, really deep bow. So there he is, blinkers, back again. I'm really thrilled with him. Gonna be a great smoke, I feel it. So there we go. The mystery is solved. Put blinkers to bed for the moment. And the moment you've all been waiting for. Appropriate in a Sherlock Holmes top hat. There they are. All the entries. I'll just reach over the prizes. 
again. Sorry about that. They are, of course, prize one and prize two. Lichbriar Blake Bars. Estate pipes, but in lovely condition. Uh, sanitized, cleaned up, all the rest of it, polished up now. Um, ready for their new owner. You may want to do all that process all over again, but. Um, they are very, very clean pipes. So there's one to first prize, one to second prize, and I will give give with that 50 grams of uh, a Lakeland tobacco of your choice. Go with either Gaweth Hogarth or Sam, Sam Gaweth. Um, you tell me what you want, tin or um, bulk, you know, pouch, 50 grams, and um, that will come with the, the prize. So here we are, the moment you've all been waiting for. There are, of course, some people who have got five entries in here, some have got three entries, and some who just put the games afoot have got one entry. But there they are. And there are 146 entries in total. Well, I'm going to have to do this sooner or later, so here goes. I can't possibly see. Number one's out of the box. The first prize. Ha! I don't have to send this very far. Chris Mercer. He's a neighbour. He's about three miles up the road. It's a fix. Chris Mercer wins one prize. <laughs> How funny. And prize number two. All right, here we go again. Hang him around. Check it all about. And that one leapt into my hand. Let's see who the second winner is. Prize number two goes to all fingers and thumbs. Uncle John. Here we are. Uncle John. Perhaps you would get in touch with me um, via email, which I will put in the description uh, box um, container below this video. And uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me with your postage details, I shall get your pro Oh, and also your choice of tobacco. I shall get it posted out to you. So there we go. The two prize winners, Chris Mercer and Uncle John. Well, that's it, folks. A bit of an anticlimax now, isn't it? Um, congratulations to the winners. Thank you all very much for taking part. And for entering into the spirit of the thing. It's been... We've had a lot of fun. I've had a lot of toing and froing with emails and things like that. Had a great laugh out of it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been um, it's been a giggle. So all the best and thank you very much for everybody that's tipped me now over the 500 mark. Um, I can't believe it, but thank you very, very much indeed. Dale Piper signing out.